Okay, let's let's go ahead and dive in. Hi, my name is Tim Sparapani. Uh, I am the founder of SPQR Strategies. Have been a long time participant in this conversation. Have been doing stuff with FOSI uh, since its inception, and uh, have been doing work in this particular area uh, since before COPPA was written in the United States. So it's been uh, two decades plus for me already in this space. I'm so excited to have uh, everyone join our breakout session uh, focused on international implications of the work that we all do. Uh, and we'll have a really broad uh, discussion with our experts today, uh, focusing on, in, in part on the age appropriate design code and then updates to COPPA uh, in the United States and everything in between. Um, I am joined by uh, a, an all-star panel of people who are the who's who of this uh, particular world and um, representing uh, governments uh, and uh, the NGO space and uh, startup work that is done to bridge uh, the regulatory gaps. And um, let me go ahead and briefly um, just uh, mention the names of our uh, uh, conversants today and have them give a brief overview of their key points. And we'll just dive right in after that. This is meant to be conversational. We'll be taking questions uh, from the audience and we'll certainly have questions at the end of the hour and leave enough time for audience directed questions. So please, as the conversation is happening, uh, feel free to add in the chat functionality questions you've got. Uh, if we can't get them in the middle of the conversation, we'll go ahead and try to get to them at the end to make sure that there's enough time. Uh, but without uh, further ado, uh, I'm joined by uh, Michael Murray, from the Information Commissioner's Office, Anna Lenhart from uh, Congresswoman Trahan's Office in the United States, Amelia Vance from the Future of Privacy Forum, and last but certainly not least, Julie Dawson of Yoti uh, from the UK. Um, I promised each of the panelists that they'll get at least one or two minutes without me interrupting at the beginning. Uh, so let me do that. Let me give Michael uh, first the opportunity to say hello and, and introduce himself and his work. Thanks, Tim. Um, as Tim said, my name is Michael Murray. I'm the Head of Regulatory Strategy at the Information Commissioner's Office, which is the UK's Data Protection Authority. Um, really critical for this is to recognize that uh, the interest of the ICO is about data protection and privacy. It's not, we're not a content regulator. So when we're talking about the age-appropriate design code, uh, the code relates to how online services uh, protect and process children's personal data. It does not uh, regulate the content that children see online. A really important distinction. Uh, some of the changes that will be happening in the UK in the next few years will start to address those issues around content through the Online Safety Bill. But for, for today's purpose, just to focus that we'll, we'll be talking about the code as a data protection code of practice. Um, and that code of practice is designed to, to help online service providers who are, whose services are likely to be accessed by children in the UK, even where those services are not aimed specifically at children. Uh, and just to clarify here, we, when we say children, we use the, uh, the UN's definition of a child as being anybody under the age of 18. And when we say online services likely to be accessed by children in the UK, those are UK companies and international companies with UK children audiences. The code applies to a whole range of online services um, likely to be accessed by children, such as websites, apps, games, social media services, and connected toys. Um, and it basically translates existing uh, legislation from the UK GDPR um, to help designers understand what we're looking for. So the 15 codes of practice, those codes of standards in the age-appropriate design code, setting out our expectations for online service providers. As a quick overview before I, I hand off back to Tim, um, these standards are largely uh, span a few fundamental pr principles, largely that we want um, services to be age appropriate by design. It means that services, for example, that are not accessed by five-year-olds don't need to design for five-year-olds, but the services should recognize that children's capacity changes as they grow older um, and what they expect from the, from the internet should change as well. We're also looking at good practice and high risk data processing, things like uh, profiling, data sharing, and geolocation tracking, um, and effective service design for children, and things like privacy information, transparency, and settings. 
The code also highlights the importance of four organizations putting the best interest of the child first in their products and services and embedding data protection by design and default. That's a quick overview. I'll hand back to Tim um, to do the other introductions. Michael, thank you so very much. Why don't I speak to another person who's doing regulatory leadership, which is Anna Lenhard, on behalf of the Congresswoman whose office she's serving. Anna, please. Hi, everyone. Yep, my name is Anna Lenhardt, and I am Congresswoman Lori Trahan's technology policy advisor. Uh, the Congresswoman sits on the Consumer Protection Subcommittee in the House of Representatives here in the United States. This is her first term on the subcommittee, and she has really made child online protections and platform accountability broadly uh, a center of her portfolio. Uh, personally, I have a technology background. I worked for years developing Salesforce.com for small businesses and nonprofits. Later, I worked at IBM and most recently served as the technologist for the House Antitrust investigation into Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Um, so the HPR redesign code has been really exciting for our office. For one, it's just really nice to see all of it spelled out in this really comprehensive document. That's been really great. I'll speak for myself and other technologists on the Hill. It's great to have that text. Um, and then there's two framings that I think are, have been really important to the conversation in the US. Um, the first is child-centric by design. Uh, for years, lawmakers have been hearing from companies about their their complicated parental controls uh, and how you know embedded they all are. Um, and look, the pandemic really highlighted that parents have a lot on their plate and they're working really hard. Uh, and so, it's we need to move into a world where if technology is designed for children, parents can expect some safety right off the bat. And you know, obviously, parental controls are still going to be there, but let's just make these things safe. So I think that framing has been fantastic and important to our office. Additionally, recognizing the child all the way up to 18. Uh, it's about time, let's do that. Um, while still recognizing that a teen is very different than a toddler um, and making sure that you're thinking of those stages of development. And then also really recognizing that teens need autonomy online as well. And so we've been really happy to, to see some of that. Um, I'll, I'll stop there and hopefully we can dive into more, but thank you all. Anna has not yet mentioned her her, her bosses and, and frankly her leadership work yet on introducing additional legislation. So I hope we're going to get a chance to give Anna some plaudits and have her talk about that legislation a little bit later. Yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Amelia Vance from the Future of Privacy Forum. Many of you know Amelia from her long work uh, in this space and leadership. Amelia, please. Thank you so much. Uh, really happy to be here today. I feel like this panel is so perfectly timed since child privacy legal frameworks are in the midst of changing all over the world, <laughs> including in multiple US states, congressional proposals, uh, and I'm honored to be a part of the conversation. So I am the VP for Youth and Education Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum. And in that role, I work with U.S. and international policymakers, schools, companies, and states on child and student privacy laws and best practices. Um, specifically relevant for today's panel, I'm part of the expert working group that was tasked with revising the OECD principles on children's privacy in the digital environment, uh, which were just released in May and now uh, working to uh, create some guidance for those with that working group. Um, and my organization just released a paper last week on the state of play related to verifiable parental consent. Um, we've been thinking a lot about this issue. We released an infographic on youth privacy and data protection 101 a few months ago, talking about sort of these risks versus benefits and how we can make sure we're carefully crafting um, legislation rules that really balance the absolute need to protect kids while allowing them to have access, as we've seen with the pandemic, to connections with friends, family, to uh, do Google searches <laughs> and to um, spend time not only on you know Disney's website, but also um, general consumer websites online. Um, and so we think that conversations regarding protection strategies should consider both the opportunities and risks uh, to hopefully promote the development of a robust, thriving online ecosystem that's also suitable for youth. So thrilled to be here today. 
Thank you, Amelia. Julie Dawson from Yoti, a company that is small but mighty and growing fast around the world, certainly playing an important role uh, in the UK on a whole series of these questions. Julie, would you please describe Yoti and, and some of your thoughts for this panel before we dive into some questions? Thank you so much, Tim and Fozzy, and also FBF. Um, for those introductions. Actually, Michael stole a lot of thunder at the beginning um, with the area that we're, we're really working on. So um, we're a company that helps consumers prove either age or identity face-to-face -face or online. And over the last year or so, have helped businesses do over 550 million age checks. So all the things that um, all the previous speakers spoke about, once you know the age of someone and their stage of development, then companies can enable um, child-centric platforms and services to be devised. So we're looking at how do those companies work out the age to then develop the right experiences. So a whole range of different ways, six different ways that companies can use. And one in particular um, is one that might well interest people using facial age analysis. And there's a white paper we've published recently using really plain English, straightforward materials, simple video as well, that hopefully will bring that to light. I'm wearing another impartial hat. I'm also part of the drafting group for the next ISO standard, developing the standard that will follow on from the PAS 1296 about age checking. So that might interest some people. Um, and the other area linking to the point of parental consent, the same approach of facial age estimation is also being used mainly in Europe at the moment as a technique around parental consent. So happy to delve into those more as we go along. Thank you, Tim. Thank you again to everyone. Um, let's go ahead and dive right in. We've got a whole series of questions and not nearly enough time to have the conversation that we need to have. I wanna begin uh, where Michael started us off, which is a discussion of the age appropriate design code. From my perspective, as a participant in all these conversations, the age appropriate design code is really driving much of the conversation, uh, it's certainly in England, of course, but uh, on the continent in Europe, and then is being copied and introduced into uh, legislative or regulatory language in many countries now around the globe, uh, which I think shows the leadership um, of the age appropriate design code. What I think is especially interesting is that for the first time as somebody who's worked in Silicon Valley, there's an explicit recognition in this document that design really matters. And that design, when it's really good, good UI can lead to good UX, which is an axiomatic thing that's said in Silicon Valley among engineers. Good user interface will lead to great user experiences. That's the good UI to good UX thing. But it also, I think, can uh, set really the ground um, you know, for good, um, positive interactions for children online, which is a value that both the age-appropriate design code and the COPPA underlying structure here in the United States really both share. So I wondered if we could start, um, Michael's mentioned some of the positives, I've mentioned another. Could, could people talk about the strengths of the age-appropriate design code for those who may not be familiar with it or are just beginning to be familiar with it? And then we can talk about some of the potential areas where there, there might still be gaps even despite the age appropriate design good. Michael, if you could also mention uh, its extraterritoriality and how you uh, in the UK are envisioning um, the, the regulatory uh, work that the age appropriate design code will do. Sure, um, I could start off the last one, Tim, and then I'll throw it open to others to comment on, on the earlier bits of those questions. Um, the, the code went through a 12 month so transition period to allow industry to start to conform with the code. And just to, to bear, uh, reiterate that the code is a design principles that are based in the UK GDPR uh, and the UK Data Protection Act. So um, it's, uh, organizations would have difficulty showing that they are complying with existing legislation if they're not conforming with the code. Um, <clears throat> we're currently moved into the supervision phase and we're working with uh, a number of companies um, sending out letters to learn a bit more about what the processing of data they're doing. Uh, we've also already seen some significant changes from the likes of TikTok and Google um, uh, and Facebook about what they're doing and not going to be doing in the future. Uh, so recognition of, of what the code, the impact the code has already had. Uh, on international standards, we're, we're talking to a, a a number of countries about the code and, and the lessons we've learned so far on those co the code. Um, 
the Irish are working on a fundamentals document that is also based on the UNCRC's um, best interest of the child and likely to be access principles. Um, Amelia's mentioned the OECD, which also has many of those principles embedded into it. So it's a direction of travel around the world that we're seeing. Um, and the UK being kind of the first out the door, essentially, with this, um, we have a lot of organizations that have been quite positive in working with us on it, but we think that this will essentially lead to, um, well, in Europe anyways, uh, conforming to the code, we'll likely see big companies like Google and others um, applying the standards of the code across the EU, not just in the UK. Um, hopefully that'll happen next in, in the US and we can maybe hand over to Anna to hear what she's got planned. Um, so I'm jumping in. <laughs> um, someone can can interrupt me, but I'll go ahead and yeah, talk about just the immediate impact the code has had because you're exactly right. Um, so first, right off the bat, by just the code being in existence, it's, it's allowed for for my boss, Congressman Trahan, along with Congresswoman Castor and Representative Markey, to send a series of letters to the social media companies and then also the gaming industry, uh, explicitly asking them, "Are you planning to make changes to abide by the code?" If so, what are those changes and do you plan on implementing them here in the US? So really easy, you're already implementing them, can you please kind of protect our children as well? And that's been an incredible tool. And as Michael mentioned, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok have announced some changes. And the beauty of that is that allows for uh, my boss along with her colleagues to ask the FTC to hold those companies accountable for what they said they were gonna do uh, under section five at our FTC. So thank you right away for, <laughs> for that sort of help. Um, you know, and it's also, it's also pushing legislation as Amelia sort of alluded to. So I'll talk about two pieces of legislation and Amelia can maybe fill in with a bunch of other ones. But the two I think that are the, the ones to be watching are the first is often what we call COPPA 2.0. Its real name is Children and Teens Online Privacy Protection Act. It's led by Senator Markey and Senator Cassidy in the Senate. It is bipartisan uh, and it makes some steps towards the age appropriate design code. So for one, uh, it prohibits internet companies from collecting personal information on anyone 13 to 15 without their consent. So kind of moving that, that age up from 13, which is where COPPA is now. Uh, it also creates a, a digital marketing bill of rights for minors. Uh, that basically puts limits on, on surveillance advertising directed at children um, and has a erasure button, so kind of right to deletion for under 15. So some definitely some steps in the right direction. And then moving to the House uh, is a bill that my boss is a co-sponsor of called the Kids Privacy Act. It is led by Rep Caster. Um, and that is, in my opinion, the bill right now in Congress that is the most similar to the Age Appropriate Design Code. I encourage everyone to check it out if you haven't. Uh, it really has a lot of the same kind of ideas and concepts being captured in it. Um, namely, again, you know, kind of limits on targeted advertising. It has language around best interest of children and teenagers, which is really great to see. Uh, requires opt-in consent for children all the way up to 18. So again, seeing that age, uh, the top age move up. Uh, also has other data rights that we care about, right to access, correction, deletion, things of that nature. Again, it's there's a lot in it because there's a lot in the age appropriate design code, but it's a really exciting piece of legislation. So um, I'll I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Maybe I can ask Julie as uh, someone from the UK, what the influence has been in the UK and with your work uh, as a company abroad, and then we can move to Amelia as well for her remarks. Thank you, Tim. Um, I think there's been some excellent work this last year by the ICO in terms of raising awareness at the ground level and with companies. So designers are actually looking to see how can they start to build from the ground up, which is a huge step forwards. And we have seen a tremendous increase from large to small companies over a wide range of sectors from the dating, the gaming, the social, the live streaming, um, live streaming that blends with adult, a whole range of different platforms. So this really has galvanized industry to start looking for solutions and i think the granularity of detail within the code is a really significant element there also we have been put forward by baroness kidron the second reading commencing this week of minimum standards around um, age assurance and as michael alluded to we have a separate um frame of work that's also underway around our online safety act so all of those are making 
any compliance officer, any legal counsel think, I need to know what's happening and I need to start to get my armament together and think how I can um, deal with this. Amelia, please, if you could. Um, and I, I want to interject that there's a, a question from the audience. And maybe, Amelia, you're the, the right person to answer it. If not, maybe others can. Uh, Amanda Lenhart, um, not to be confused with Anna, um, but also another expert and longstanding expert in the space. Uh, she re released research and, and talked about it earlier today, as she oftentimes does. Asked the question, if the panelists can talk more about age of consent in the current pending legislation, I think she means both the age appropriate design code and others that are uh, you know, copying it around the globe, but also in uh, legislation pending before Congress. Um, she wants to know, is it that young people themselves get to have more agency and be consulted about use of data, or is it that their parents need to be involved or contacted around data collection for these younger teens? Um, I can think of nobody better than Am Amelia to start answering that along with talking about other things she likes about the age appropriate design code. Absolutely. Well, I'll go down the geeky rabbit hole first because it brings me a lot of joy. Um, so yeah, we, we've seen a wide variety of proposals in the US around the world on the age, but most tend to be at minimum 16. So I think it's inevitable no matter what else happens, uh, you're going to just see this agreement of the age moving from 13 to 16. Anyone who wants to fight about it, I'm sorry, you're going to lose. That's just inevitably where we're going. The bigger question is, do we have a jump from 16 to 18? And if so, what does that look like? And as uh, uh, Amanda alluded to, there's a lot of big questions about when parents should stop being the holder of those rights and it should pass uh, to teens, uh, which is very important, especially when you consider you know, how difficult it is. Um, as we talked about in our um, verifiable parental consent paper last week, to get parents to go through that process. You have parents who have three jobs, you have kids whose parents are not available, you have people who are understandably intimidated about entering their credit card information to let their child play a game. And so there's a lot of feelings there. There's also the edge cases, kids who are in homes with abusive parents, student, um, children who may be LGBT, and if their parents know, they could be thrown out of the house. There, it, there's all sorts of situations, and as children get older, it becomes more and more important to have that conversation about when they should own those rights, because they should have all those protections. I don't think anyone has a problem with that. And you've seen a mix of proposals. Um, I honestly think globally, uh, other countries have been a lot better about that. I think because uh, there is that UN principle about children having control over their information, there's already that nuanced thought there uh, from what, 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago <laughs> at this point. Um, in the US, it's been half and half. We've seen proposals that have given parents full rights and only parents full rights up to 16 or 18. We've seen proposals that provide a dual right of both the parent and the child uh, over age 13 through 16. Um, and then in the laws we've seen passed for consumer privacy, uh, CCPA was under age eight under age 16, uh, Virginia's is uh, just under 13, as is Cal uh, Colorado's for the moment, but it's difficult and that's more complicated than it appears because oftentimes the definition of sensitive data in those consumer privacy laws includes children's data and guess what, there are special protections uh, and consent mechanisms and things that would apply beyond age 13. Um, so it's definitely actively discussed. As I said, we're getting to a higher age there, um, but it's important to be very careful and very nuanced here. And going back to the original question, this is what the UK I think has done extremely well. Um, first of all, in process, the research funded by the ICO to talk to children themselves, in addition to parents. I think in the US, we far too often conflate 
talking to parents and talking to children as if they have the exact same interests and opinions. Uh, and you find really interesting things. Sonia Livingstone, a brilliant, brilliant top probably child privacy researcher in the world, um, did some amazing work um, to build a lot of components of the age appropriate design code based on her research and found things about how children are thinking about privacy, especially when they're young, how that evolves over time. And that directly fed into things like the just in time notices uh, that are part of the code um, to make sure that kids, depending on age, uh, might have different needs, might need to be talked to in different ways. And those age bands are such a sophisticated way of thinking about this. Kids who are five are very different from kids who are 15. Um, and I really hope that the US keeps up with that. Uh, my only concern is that the US is a little different when it comes to how we can regulate the internet, largely because we had this battle back in the 1990s where we tried to be much stricter about, you know, limiting, making the internet a bit friendlier for kids. And it failed a challenge, you know, I think it was at the Fourth Circuit at Supreme Court, uh, which is how we got to COPPA in the first place. So whether the US is able to duplicate what we have here is an open question and whether globally this framework that really does make the internet friendlier and easier and more privacy protective for kids, whether that also changes the experiences of adults for better or for worse is sort of yet to be seen there. Thank you. Specific question for Michael, because I'm not going to ask Michael to critique the age appropriate design code specifically, but maybe Michael, you could very briefly tell us if you're seeing extraterritorial effects of the ICO's work, are companies which are operating outside of the UK um, expanding uh, their work to include the age-appropriate design code just for people within the UK, or are they doing it uh, globally? And then for the rest of the panelists, and I hope they'll, they'll dive in, what things would you like to see um, in, in other versions of the age-appropriate design code as it's propagated uh, internationally and, and perhaps brought it to the United States as well? Maybe Michael, we could begin with you. Uh, well, sort of, um, we, because the code has just gone, entered, uh, uh, finished this transition period, we not fully aware of what changes everybody has made. Um, we had a, a letter from Five Rights, which is a, a UK based rights organization who's done some research into some of the issues that have presented, but that research was done um, in summer. So before the end of the transition period. So we almost have to keep going with uh, from the September 2nd date when, the, when the, the code came into full effect to see what some companies are doing. And that's the process of, of uh, gathering information where I'm, that's underway at the moment. Um, but again, the, the larger social media platforms have started um, and many of them have indicated that they're not just uh, making the changes to the UK, it is across Europe. And that's not just in social media, it's also the games companies, the, those platforms are, are doing similar work. Uh, largely also because it's not just the ICO, it's not just the UK. Again, it's the Irish doing, um, preparing to launch their fundamentals document, which um, in many ways is very similar to, to the code and picks up on its main features. So the I think the online services see this as a direction of travel that um, they need to keep up with. Um, and better do to, to get going with it um, to keep ahead of, of the game. Um, there's still issues, there's still things that we need to address. Um, and largely, partly it's technology and companies such as Julie's is going to be really important in helping us solve things like um, age appropriate design, what that means when, uh, when it's difficult for companies to know what the age of the user is. But, um, I think what we're, what we're basically asking companies to do is, is start off by trying to identify who their users are. We're not saying to a company that they must design their services for a five-year-old if no five-year-olds use their service. It is an age appropriate, so who actually uses those services? And they shouldn't be hiding behind the, the, uh, the excuse that, well, it's kind of designed for older kids, older people, and um, that uh, the kids, um, we don't know if kids are, are taking part. Well, they should know. 
um, and they should be doing that data mapping and they should be doing the user research to, to know how they should be designing services. If they can't and they don't know, they should be applying the, the code to all users and that's what we're expecting. Maybe I can ask Julie to respond directly because Julie's uh, company, Yoti, does amazing work with liveness and with uh, age estimation. And maybe, Julie, you can talk about how Yoti and similar companies are helping uh, provide the knowledge to companies that Michael's talking about, about who are their constituents, who is using the service, so that the, the age-appropriate group is getting the design they need. Maybe you could speak to that, Julie. Yes. Look, there's a really key element there that we don't actually want to know who it is, just want to know that whoever it is is over the right age. And there's a brilliant chart actually that FPF did, which looks at how do you sort of set apart the different facial technologies from detecting that this is a human face um, to then looking at the characteristics or analysis. And that is quite different from either recognizing one to one that this is duly coming back or recognizing Julie's face out of you know 10,000 people at a football match. And one of the things that I think it's taking people time to filter is that you can have biometric technology that just recognizes and, analyze, and analyzes a face with no unique recognition of one individual. And that has been something that, that I think has taken time, but we're now starting to have a, a wider number of constituents across both civil society and within regulatory bodies that understand that distinction. Um, I think looking at that and then understanding what safeguards need to be put in place absolutely is key. So looking at independent audit, um, clear trust registries that, that then show those audits, looking at the accuracy, looking at the bias, looking at the transparency under the hood, the audit trail of how images um, are actually um, consented and, and put together to actually build these algorithms. That is really important. I think also working on the standard side is, is key so that organizations and also businesses, um, governments around the world can refer to specific standards. And we're not all starting with Groundhog Day in multiple countries around the world. Um, and if we start to have proactive dialogue between regulators and governments, we can hopefully get there quicker. The EU consent project has been a really good example of that, where now there is a project across Europe looking at interoperability across age verification and parental consent um, methods. I think another really good thing has been the work that the ICO has led in this area through its ICO sandbox and looking at approaches and looking at that proactive engagement with industry. Um, so all of those would be things that I would exhort um, and speaking in plain English, it's, it's up to companies like ours to explain clearly and transparently what they're building, how they've built it, um, and what is under the hood, so that man on the street, woman, child on the street can all understand this. Uh, Anna and Amelia, maybe, uh, maybe I'll start with Anna first. You could talk about what, you know, what could be added to the age-appropriate design code or what modifications might be necessary for the U.S. market from your your perspective, that of your boss um, yeah. and other members who are interacting with the place. Yeah, so I think there are two things that we're actively thinking about. It's an ongoing conversation. So the first is the age-appropriate design code has great language about in the best interest of the child. I think what we're still working out is what does that mean when we're talking about technology design that's maybe not tied directly to the child's data? So for example, a game has a loot box in it, but the loot box is not targeted to the child based on their personal profile. Um, so page 45 of the code has some language that alludes to, hey, that's loot boxes are generally not in the best interest of the child. Um, but it, again, there's kind of wanting more clarity there. So in domestically, we have a bill called the Kids Act, uh, again, led by Rep Caster and Senator Markey. I, my boss is one of the leads in the house as well. And it starts to get at some of this so really saying, you know, let's put limits on endless scroll, likes, um, manipulative uh, kind of advertising uh, that might be divorced from the data. So that's one kind of conversation that's going on right now. And then what our office has been working really hard on is education technology. Um, so this summer, our office released a staff draft of a student privacy and ed tech oversight bill, uh, which I can put in the chat. Um, and we're trying to dive into how do we get the principles in the children's code into the classroom 
being mindful that the business model can be a little bit different. So not all ed tech is sold directly to a parent. Uh, some of it goes through a contract with the school. Some of it goes or is set up by a teacher. Uh, so the data rights, especially the, the right to deletion can be a little different. So we're working on that text. Um, and then also, you know, when parents send their children to school, they trust the school is making decisions to optimize the child's learning outcomes. Uh, you know, right now we have a situation where ed tech companies can say they're using personalized learning AI to lead to X, Y, Z improvement in reading scores, but there's little transparency into that use of first party student data and if it's truly leading to better educational outcomes. So the draft bill does require technology impact assessments and asks for more justification uh, into how that student data is being used while still allowing for innovation. So kind of getting to that context specific nature of things. Thank you. Amelia, do you want to chime in very briefly? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I'm trying to remember which question we were on. Uh, but we've seen a lot of the code sort of spilling its way over and also just so much more attention to child privacy over the past year. I mean, it, it just in the past six months, Congress has held four hearings, introduced five bills, and sent seven letters focused on child and student privacy concerns. Uh, I, I don't think we have certainly not seen that at any point uh, that I have uh, been working on this issue. Um, it sounds like we really haven't since the 90s. Um, and so there is this massive interest in the U.S. from policymakers in regulating big tech consumer privacy laws include these new protections for kids. Um, and then uh, on the other side of the pond uh, in late 2020, um, the European Data Protection Board published its 2021 to 2023 strategies, and they identified the protection of minors' privacy um, as a top priority, uh, specifically not only because the GDPR provides for specific protections um, when underage data subjects are involved, um, but also just in recognition of the specific vulnerabilities of and the online products used by these audiences. And since then, um, certainly the UK was leading the pack on a lot of this uh, with Ireland not far behind, but uh, we have the French uh, Data Protection Authority, um, which uh, is dedicating efforts to guiding controllers, including schools and enforcing the GDPR's rules on minor age verification and exercise of children's children's data protection rights. The Swedish DPA said that they were planning to conduct an investigation on the use of children's data and research contacts. Um, I think it was, I don't know that anyone has a sense of time anymore. This summer, um, you had the Italian DPA uh, had a bit of a, a, a battle with TikTok that flat out was banning the use of anyone on the platform unless they could prove that they were over, uh, I think the age was 13 or 16. Um, and so this is, I think, probably the biggest growth of child privacy conversations ever. Uh, and, and I think it benefits us all that so much of this is built upon uh, what the UK has done here because it was so deliberate, so based in research, um, hint, hint, people fund more US research. Um, and I think that's important. I do worry, I wanna make sure that we're being careful that we're not necessarily collecting more data about users that they're not aware of uh, in order to protect them. And so I know Yodi has been particularly good at, I, I think, avoiding some of the traps here um, but age assurance and estimation involves collecting more data, data that people may not be aware of. In the U.S. in particular, we don't have really digital identity cards in a way that other countries may have. And so it's much harder to verify age without collecting a whole lot of information, making inferences based on typing speed and other things, um, you know, potentially running into equity issues when we know that um, some software is going to assume that children of 
different races are older because of our own biases or lack of certain training data. And so, again, making sure that while we're protecting kids, we're keeping these nuances in mind, we're thinking about what causes more data to be collected it is so important here. Julie, you were mentioned specifically, as was Yoti by Amelia just a moment ago. I wonder if we could talk very briefly, and I, we're, we're getting through this hour quite quickly. So people, let me just say, if you're watching, there are at least 90 of you online. Please send your questions in. We're going to be asking them in just a few minutes here to the panelists. We're going to go through things, hopefully, a pretty rapid fire here. Uh, could we have, Julie, you talk about uh, the importance of age estimation and age verification. And, and ways you're seeing it be used to help kids thrive online. And then I'd love to have the other panelists talk more about, not just about you know, data privacy, important value to me when, you know, as a privacy lawyer uh, and for the last couple of decades, but also about how we have children thrive as they're interacting online when they're spending more and more of their time there. Perfect, no, with pleasure, I'll give you a few different examples. So um, we're working, for example, with the NSPCC child line in the UK to let a child share a data minimised just the fact they're under 18 to apply to have an indecent or sexting image taken offline. We're working with social media platforms such as Sayubo um, that use our facial ed estimation for triage. They have 40 plus million users. They want to check that it is a 13 to 8, 17 year old in that chat room, not an eight year old, and not a 38 year old. So the first initial triage could be using the facial age estimation, and then they could go to requiring maybe someone that looks really old to be in that area to share data minimized just under 18 through one of our other methods. Um, and the same, it could be stopping an eight or a 13 year old trying to get in that 18 plus area. Similarly, going forwards now, we could be enabling platforms to say, how do I switch off geolocation, tracking minors, not enabling, you know, five-year-olds to live stream to 50, 50-year-olds, look at age appropriate content moderation, all of those things with the age bands. So the facial age estimation is now accurate to 1.28 years for six to 12-year-olds. And about one and a half year olds, one and a half years of accuracy from, um, from 14 up to 24. All the way from six to 60 is just over two years of accuracy. So this can enable platforms to start to work in those age bands where that is appropriate. Um, in other instances, it might be just looking at over 18s or just looking at over 21s. So it gives people tools that they didn't previously have in their armory. The facial age analysis, it's just looking at an image, image is instant deleted, nothing is retained, we don't retain anything from it. All we do is just assessing the image giving the response and a confidence level back to the platform. Um, there is a lot more in the white paper, um, the link is in the chat and we are in, in, in a booth if, if people have more granular detail, really happy to give more information on that. But we now have be it console companies, global gaming companies, social and others that are exploring what are the range of techniques and they want to look at different techniques in different areas to give consumers choice. So of the six, they might turn three on in country A, four on in country B, and work out what is the right one for that use case, be it for a child, be it for an adult. I think that's, does that good enough, Tim? It is, it's fantastic, Julie. I wonder if we can have other panelists very briefly talk about how we can help kids thrive online and what role regulation and enforcement may play uh, in the coming years and months, months and years, uh, to help kids thrive online um, as well. Well, I think we can start with the code anyways. Um, it's, we want the internet to be available for kids and it's not, it's, it's not designed to age gate children out of the internet. It's designed to create a safe place for them to learn and to grow and develop. And as they develop, they take on more responsibility and are given more choice. Um, there is in the UK a sort of 13 age consent, um, but um, we we're looking at one of the centers of the code, for example, is on parental um, controls. And rather than talking about parental controls and, and having control of your child, the code talks about um, children knowing when parental controls are in place. 
So being aware, uh, having that conversation with the parents about what the parents are looking at and, and as the children grows older, taking more control over what they do. Uh, the code, for example, um, insists on profiling being off by default. Now that doesn't mean that kids won't be able to get their um, Spotify uh, recommendations list, but it gives them the, op the option to say, I don't want these ads, I don't want to be profiled. If they do want to and they grow a bit older and they're past 13 and they can consent to themselves, then they can choose to turn on the things that they want. What we want to see uh, with a high privacy by default setting with the code is that a child, a teenager in the bedroom is not going to be trolled by a 38-year-old pedophile who's looking for opportunities to get to know them. Um, so the child can, has that sort of built-in protections and then the code allows them to add um, have a choice about how their data is used and, and the protections that they want in place. So that gives them the opportunity to grow and develop online and to still enjoy the online services, ideally. I can jump in really fast too and say, this is a question Please. we're thinking about a lot as well, but more from kind of the new research questions that have popped up over time. Like what is the impact of social media on teen mental health? Um, and so, one thing we've been working on, we, uh, our office introduced the Social Media Data Act this spring, which aims to get researchers who are studying child development online, mental health, um, anything related to social media, to be able to get the data they need to do the, that research really comprehensively and to do it in a way that still minds users' privacy. We're hoping to do more work in that transparency space so we can really understand the impact of endless scroll of likes and comments of these types of design features on the development of children. So, which admittedly, I think is, uh, you know, a trickier space to be in. So uh, we're excited about that. We're getting a bunch of questions now. Please keep submitting them in the chat, uh, folks who are watching. We'd love to be able to ask your question. Um, at the top of the hour, uh, Ann Collier, well known to many of us as one of the true leaders in online safety has been for forever, it seems. So, Anne, thank you again for your leadership. Asked a question about whether or not recent whistleblowers uh, that have gotten a lot of public attention are affecting this conversation, both internationally and domestically. I wonder if people could respond um, to Anne's question about the, the impact, if any, of recent whistleblower revelations. Well, it caused directly two of the congressional hearings I mentioned. So, it's having an impact. Agreed. Uh, any other thoughts, comments? I mean, I think what's interesting that I've been listening really hard for is, is privacy versus the content moderation. I think the whistleblowers allegations have really highlighted the need for, you know, trust oversight of trust and safety practices. You can, you know, Europe, you have the DSA. Uh, we do not. So that's part of the conversation. But then what is the role of data? Right. So, you know, it's one thing for teens to see problematic content, but if it's being targeted to them based on their personal data, that's a privacy law. So I think we are hearing both conversations happen. Jim, just one thing to add there. I think one of the things that Francis Hogan brought out quite clearly was that platforms do actually already know the age of their users frequently and frequently to pretty accurate level. Um, however, and, and it's not illegal, it's mainly in their terms of service that they have said that they would be, you know, not allowing users, say, under the age of 13. So what is clear from the testimony, if that is proven accurate, is that platforms do have ways today. And this then has brought up the next question. Um, should platforms be allowed to mark their home, own homework? Should they be required to use a blend of um, services so that there is a check and balance? And then how can regulators have the capacity to audit and review those methods, be it in-house, external, or a blend of those? And I think one of the things that has come out, I, I was um, called to give evidence at the UK Online Safety um, DCMS Committee last week. And one of the things that is really clear is there's now a lot more thought going into how can the, the appointed regulator actually undertake the required audit and the risk reviews of platforms? So it's, it's, it's taking 
the questions to a more granular degree of how do you actually implement that and on an ongoing basis, how do you keep your knowledge up to date? More questions are coming in. One recently from uh, Alison Starks who asks uh, whether the panelists have any ideas about school's role and responsibility in helping youth understand digital privacy. Um, she points out these aren't mandatory standards in schools and that the messaging tends to be more on individuals' responsibility uh, rather than understanding the business model of data tracking. So could any of the panelists speak to what they think schools' roles are in, or schools' role is in um, discussing uh, digital privacy and advancing that concept? I'll leave it open to anyone who wants to grab it. So uh, I would point again to the UK here uh, and their, you know, my data and privacy online toolkit for young people, which was again based in research funded by the ICO uh, and sort of fundamental to again the evidence based policies that were put in place through the code. It's phenomenal. We have nothing like it in the US um, and we're also behind Canada, which has had this sort of research and ongoing grants from uh, their data protection authority for years and Australia and <laughs> Keneal in France and everyone else. The US hasn't done a great job of anything other than focusing on compliance. We have focused on let's get parent, get parent consent and that's it. And as we've had in broader conversations, notice and consent isn't necessarily the best framework. It doesn't provide the underlying protections that are most useful. Yes, we have some of those protections in COPPA. We certainly have them in the school space with the 130 plus student privacy laws that have passed in states over the past seven years. Um, but we haven't done as much. And when it comes to the school role in this space, uh, there's a lot of great work being done by Common Sense Media and others in providing digital citizenship curriculum. But so little of that is privacy. Um, Berkman Klein Center at Harvard has done a really phenomenal job as a great little database um, and also has a report comparing digital citizenship sort of uh, approaches in different companies that I would point people to. Schools are vital here. Right now, we're not focusing as much on privacy, even just the individual, like what individuals can do uh, other than don't post photos online that you don't want your parents to see. Uh, and that's a real shame because while we require digital citizenship and curriculum in most states, not much of that focus is on privacy. And in, uh, in the UK, we've, we're designing lesson plans for schools on, on privacy and um, the code specific lesson plans to try to raise awareness. Uh, part of the, our problem is kids um, by their nature more uh, take more risks and they don't necessarily understand. They understand privacy as they get older, but they might not understand the business model that drives the privacy. So they understand the, that they don't want their location un, um, made public, but they don't see how companies share data um, and um, use learn, uh, machine learning to, to infer data, for example. So we're trying to, to help kids learn, but the, one of the issues is there's a great sort of fear of missing out culture in kids, um, and they don't want to be missing out on what their, what their colleagues are doing. So helping children understand the business model is important, but there's also a role about helping parents understand their role in all of this. And that's the sort of the forgotten element is how we improve parental digital literacy. But to be honest with you, the, the real responsibility should lie with the, with the online service to design their service in a way that keeps kids safe and doesn't put the pressure back on kids to, to choose not to do the things that their, their colleagues and their, their, their peers are doing. Yeah, and yeah, I would like to- really important here. Anna, go ahead. I, yeah, very, very really, really quickly. So as part of the ed tech, uh, open comment period, we had a really great round table with parents in the district, the Congresswoman's district last week. And this was something they brought up a lot is wanting to be able to teach their kids about digital footprints. And the other thing I'll flag for this conversation is we heard from a lot of parents saying it can't just be in English only. Um, you know, we our district has a lot of people that speak a lot of different languages. And we had parents actually come and speak to us in Spanish with translators saying, you got to help me. I need this to be not just in English. So just that's important too. It's a great shout out. I promised all of the panelists that I would ask them the things they're optimistic about, the things they're pessimistic about, 
And if they had one thing that they wanted you to take away, since we've got only five minutes left, I'm gonna go and do this really quickly. So Michael, you're gonna get to go first. What are you optimistic about? What are you pessimistic about? And what is the one thing that you'd like to have everyone um, here? And then we'll go right through the rest of the panels. So hopefully we can get this done. Maybe we'll ask another question if, if time permits. Yeah. Uh, optimistic, I think technology is developing and we've seen um, an article this week about um, privacy by code. So there's there's changes happening in um, coding and design that could make this a lot easier for companies to, to institute in the future. Pessimistic, um, I think there's no, there is as yet no silver bullet for age assurance that works in all situations. Um, and we're a bit worried that, um, that some people might use that as a way to try to weaken legislation um, but we'll we'll have people on this in this call that are doing their best to to challenge that as well so that's great um, a takeaway um, it's just the logical thing to do and I think um, we, what we want to see is is that companies um, don't feel that they have to age gate kids out of the internet much like a restaurant doesn't age gate a child out of out of services but they offer that service as a, as a kids menu um, the, then a child can order from that menu or if they get older and they want something a bit spicier they can order from the adult menu but in no time does that child um, get allowed to have a bourbon on the side with their, with their happy meal. So if, if organizations can, online services can start thinking in a ways that, that puts safety and privacy at the heart of what they do, they'll be fine and we'll see a much better internet for everybody. Anna, if you would please, your turn. Yeah, really fast. Um, so I'm staying optimistic about the Build Back Better Act. And for those of you on the call who don't know, uh, that is going to be a huge piece of legislation, but it has a half a billion dollars in funding for the FTC uh, to do privacy enforcement specifically. And I do think that will lead to more COPPA cases, which is very exciting. Um, what am I nervous about? Uh, enforcement. You know, you can write a really great bill, but in the United States, if we continue to underfund our leading agency, namely the FTC, uh, it's not going to get enforced. So uh, I'm always nervous about that. And then key takeaway, especially in the U.S. context, uh, we need comprehensive privacy and online protections uh, to protect every consumer, uh, and that'll protect kids too. So the U.S. has got to got to catch up. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. You get to go next, and then we'll finish with Amelia. Julie, please. I'm really optimistic that we're seeing many regulators around the world look at this and embrace the work around standards um, and having a language which is common. In terms of pessimism, I think it's more the, the, the CSAM and the transparency from platforms that worries me. We're seeing still very, very rising cases where um, CSAM is highly prevalent and we're still not fully tackling that. And in terms of one thing I would really like to see happen, um, it's actually keeping on a thoughtful debate to understand the nuances in the technology. And that does require some nuanced thinking around bi biometrics. Amelia, please. All right, optimistic. The conversation is happening and we have so many great resources to inform the conversation and hopefully everyone takes advantage of those um, because we didn't have so many of them a year ago, five years ago, et cetera. It's great to build policy on evidence, on you know good templates and we have that. Um, pessimistic. We're not defining our risks well. There's a lot of, uh, as Anna said, sort of this conflation of some content moderation, some privacy, and it, at the same time, there's also this growing lack of trust between parents and government and parents and big tech. This all leads potentially to legislation that shuts students out of the internet instead of protecting them while they're on the internet, uh, which as we know, a lesson of COPPA is that that just means kids lie about being on the internet and not that, you know, they don't have access to that technology. Um, what to take away, uh, pay attention, especially companies. Um, and this can't be sort of a one and done thing. Our laws, the compliance operations set up in companies need to be cultivating an ongoing revisiting 
of child privacy protections and access uh, because if this isn't something that we're constantly looking at, if it is a check the box activity, we're going to have the same conversation in a decade or two decades. So how do we make sure that this does become something embedded by design uh, in what we're building moving forward? Um, and that requires a lot of conversations and a lot of nuance and can hope that our policymakers uh, will be having those conversations. And just like that, we finished it in an hour on international implications, and we didn't even get to the COPPA updates, which I know a lot of people wanted to talk about. Um, I want to thank everyone who stayed in our breakout session. I want to let you know that you all have a break for a brief period of time before the rest of the FOSI conference um, continues for the rest of the day. I want to thank my four panelists. They're experts in their field. I know that they are really doing important leadership work in their field. I also want to thank everyone who, who's been putting um, comments in the chat. We've had a whole bunch of people put resources, including uh, some work from the eSafety um, Commissioner's Office in Australia. Other pieces of legislation have been flagged. Um, folks should look in the chat for a series of those resources. Um, but I just want to say thank you once again to my panelists, and I wish everyone a great rest of the day and the rest of the conference. Thanks so very much. Um, enjoy your break, people. Bye now.